Stay up to date on the latest political news this election season for less. Visit inforum.news forward slash port and get three months of unlimited access to our news network for only 99 cents a month. Subscribe now at inforum.news forward slash port. This podcast is brought to you by the North Dakota Petroleum Foundation. From heating our homes and powering our vehicles to cell phones, clothing, and medical equipment, oil and natural gas makes everyday life better. North Dakota Oil and Natural Gas, advancing the possibilities. Learn more at ndpetroleumfoundation.org. Forum Communications Company is proud to be a part of the Trust Project. Learn more at thetrustproject.org. Welcome to Plane Talk, and uh, so I, I don't think I probably need to tell any of you this, but the nature of our debate over the issue of abortion has has changed. It's it's not the same debate it was in the past. In the past, it was a legal argument, um, and it's not anymore. Uh, it's now a matter of public policy to debate it to be debated in our democratic institutions, our legislatures, at our ballot boxes. And that's a good thing. I wrote a column in, in the wake of it, and I and it's, it's funny because the ACU actually kind of pitched this interview to me on the basis of my column. My column was, I, I think it was, it was kind of, um, I was arguing that that more protests won't make abortion legal in North Dakota. And, and I think I probably could have been clearer because obviously protests are hugely important to the democratic process. My argument was protesting outside of the Supreme Court is not going to accomplish very much at this point. I understand people are mad. They're venting. I don't begrudge them that. Whatever I may feel about their positions, that's that. And Cody, you you wrote a blog post, though, about how important protest is. And I, I have a feeling we're going to talk about it. I have a feeling we're going to spend a lot of time probably agreeing, at least on that concept. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah. Oh, well, thanks for having me, Rob. Uh, you know, I think what happened was after the your your article, I mean, I think there were moments in which, uh, you know, especially among our team, you know, we had uh, we had that typical debriefing conversation, right? We were reading it. You met, you mentioned us and, and quoted me uh, briefly in it. And we were, as we were going through, you know, we were like, oh, you know, well, Rob makes some good points, but also Rob's wrong, right? Like that was, <laughs> that was kind of our conversation, right? In, in staff meeting. And so we decided that we would, you know, we'd want to uh, just kind of put out there, you know, because of our, um, the, the stress and the importance on the First Amendment uh, and how important it is, but also the logistics around it. And, and sure. you're right, you, you probably, you and I probably have, a number of places where we would agree on it, but I thought it was. Uh, well, let's let's was, talk about the places where where Rob Port's yeah. supposedly wrong. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it was really. I mean, it was more so. I think coming down to, um, you know, sort of, and like you just said, you might have, you know, maybe there's lost in translation or for brevity, right? I know I'm a writer as well, and you sort of sometimes finesse points, and then uh, people think that you said something different. Um, but I think uh, really around the, you know, sort of the just a, if I may boil it down to like you know, do protests do anything, right? And and I think that for us, you know, obviously, you know, everybody has the right to express uh, themselves. Um, but from a logistical standpoint, um, you know, protesting has, uh, is a great way uh, to raise issues, you know? And, and I think maybe one of the things we could talk about is because I know you commented about, you know, raising awareness. Um, but I think that when we do things like a protest, it, it change it can change the conversation in different places because um like an issue like abortion um it, it doesn't always get talked about at the kitchen table um it's been you know it's off and on as a taboo issue or at least how deep we go into talking about it and i think that the more we raise the issue uh there there might be those who might start to talk about it who wouldn't have otherwise you i know? actually and the funny thing is is we we really agree on this I, and I understand that you're coming from this. Your organization has long argued that that there's a right to abortion in the U.S. Constitution. The Supreme Court just mm -hmm. just struck that down, but that I'm assuming is still your organization's position, despite the yeah, ruling but, of the court. Yes, and I would say that you know what what's happening right now for us is obviously uh, looking at you know how how to get that right back, right, and that's sure. going to take a lot of different tactics in different states so, etc you know so, yeah. so so yeah so let me let me build on that one of the one of the problems i had with reading into the u.s constitution a right to abortion that i i don't think mm -hmm. exists separate from whether or not it should exist 
my argument was it didn't exist. There was never an amendment added to that constitution that was explicitly intended to create a right to an abortion. Um, mm-hmm. I always had a problem with that. And one of the reasons why is I, I think one of the re- you just described in that it took the abortion issue away from us. We didn't we didn't discuss it at our tables. We could sort of sweep it under the rug and say, well, that's just too I don't want to deal with it. Or the people who did talk about it, I think left and right could adopt some pretty extreme positions on it that maybe weren't weren't even reflective of where most Americans are on the question because it wasn't part of the democratic process. The courts reached down, grabbed it, put it in the Constitution, and said, basically, you can't do anything with this through the democratic process. I, I think that was a shame. I think it did a terrible, terrible disservice to Americans on this issue. I think we would be in a much healthier place, right? I mean, the abortion, without question, one of the most contentious political issues that, that have faced our country in, in modern history. Um, I think we'd be in a much healthier place had we solved this question democratically instead of through the courts. Um, I, and I, I think that really matters. Pr- one of the geniuses of the American system of government, and, and really any sort of democracy, is that it allows buy-in, right? Like, I, I feel like if I go, and like a ballot measure, for instance, right? You're for it, I'm against it, we have the debate, one of us loses... Maybe I don't like losing, but I can at least say, well, you know, I made my case and and I guess maybe I'll try again in some other way. I think that's so important. And I think we just did a terrible disservice to ourselves on this question by, by moving it outside of the democratic process. That's been a point that I've been trying and it gets lost in how because everybody sees it through the lens of how they want what they want abortion policy to be. And to me, like, I'm over here making the process argument, which nobody wants to hear, right? So, but I, I do. I, I think it's important, and I think it should be central to this debate. Well, and I, I appreciate the process argument, actually, uh, because I do think uh, process and backstory, et cetera, are all really, really important. And and I think that does create conversation around the kitchen table in a different way when it is a policy matter. And, of course, now we're about to see that uh, and are seeing it. But, you know, I, so first of all, you know, I wasn't alive when uh, when Roe v. Wade, Wade happened. So I don't know what the I don't know what the conversations were at the time. I've heard various things. But I think where for me, part of the disservice is um, in, in that. Whether regardless of reading of the Constitution. Right. So whether there's a you know that right to privacy that would protect abortion. Um, is the convert i mean we have been having a conversation about it for the last 50 years and as someone who you know grew up in some of those conversations in the church that i grew up in as a kid um and various conversations of you know that happened in school etc when we would talk about this in a learning setting you know uh, for me there was so much shame around the conversation um you know so it was always about a, this the focus has been on the moral question, right? Rather than the constitutionality or the policy side of it. And and so I think that that, um, you know, I, I guess I am sort of, you know, I am glad I agree with you that maybe that, that conversation would maybe change things. Um, However, you know, again, you and I, we, we, we shouldn't probably debate the, the constitutional interpretation because we know where we stand on that one. But I think that having the process conversation is really interesting. So I, yeah. I appreciate you, you pointing in that direction. Well, it's because here's, here's one thing. I, I, you, you look at that, that, um, that period between when Roe v. Wade was handed down and when Dobbs was handed down. Mm-hmm. We had legislatures across the country continue to legislate. But they were legislating in a very weird way, which is all these trigger laws that, that are now I- including in North Dakota. So let's look at North Dakota specifically. We yeah. have a, we have a trigger law that is is probably going to take effect. I know there's still litigation, but it's it's probably going to take effect here at some point. Yeah. Um, that was passed by Democratic lawmakers. Democratic lawmakers introduced it. Um, several Democratic lawmakers, including some very progressive lawmakers who are still in office today, voted for it. And uh-huh. one of the reasons behind the scenes, now I haven't spoken to any of them directly, and so I don't want to, but one of the things that, that, that progressive people have kind of told me behind the scenes as well, well, they voted for it because they never thought it was going to take effect. And I think that that is probably the reality for a lot of these laws, not just for Democrats, but for Republicans, right? Because it became very uh-huh. easy to sort of talk about abortion. We're going to ban all abortions except for instances of rape or incest or health of the mother. We're going to do all these things. And nobody really had to think about 
as a practical matter of a policy, how do we enforce a rape exception to an abortion? I, I don't know the good answer to that because I know how the criminal justice system works. Do we have to convict somebody in court of rape before we can have the exception for abortion? That's not going to happen within a, within a, a pr the window of a pregnancy. So obviously, like, we have made some policies that we never really intended to, to become law because we thought Roe was just going to be there forever. And now suddenly we have to, right and left, we have to really think about the policy we're making. I think that's as much of a headache as it's going to be, a real pain in the rear end. I think that's a good thing. We have to think about this stuff. It's really going to impact people now. We have to think about this stuff. Yeah. I, I mean, I think I would agree from a, from a policy from the sausage making argument, right? I think that it is a, uh, it, it probably is, it, it is good. I, I think that, you know, it's unfortunate that because of the culture wars, uh, the policy making process in the past, the debates and the argument around. So like you said, progressive voting for it because they thought it would never take effect. The same thing with maybe those in the middle or even some on the right who, you know, that isn't their, their issue that they hang their hat on. I think that the, 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 um, it is unfortunate that that took place because now it, it really takes, like you said, it, I mean, it's, it's, it, from my perspective, it's going to hurt people uh, because of this. Uh, it's going to make things challenging for people in, in, um, in being able to exercise, you know, have, or having a right taken away uh, from our perspective. But I would say that um, the, I think it actually points to a, a bigger issue uh, of the polarization and the changing politics from 2007 till today. And so, I mean, I would be even interested, Rob, on, on your thoughts on that with the, the polarization, you know, you know, yes, I, I, I see your point that um, had, had the Supreme Court not made that decision, you know, 50 years ago, um, maybe we would have been having the conversation differently. But I, what, what about sort of that, you know, I, I would raise questions around the context of the argument at the moment right um you know why why these individuals would you know what was the politics that would say to a progressive to say like well i'm going to vote for it too and then fill in the blank why did they do that um well, like I, you, said, I, you haven't well, talked to anybody well, neither have i so well, you know, I, well, we I, I, sus I, suspect, right? I suspect part of the i mean you look at some of the lawmakers i mean they were from western north dakota rural districts and and they may have been mm -hmm. personally pro-choice but just didn't want to pick a fight and mm -hmm. if you're voting for a law that's not going to take effect anyway, or so you thought, I think the calculation is there. Why pick a fight? Why pick a fight on a contentious issue that I don't have to pick a fight on? Because this right. vote ultimately doesn't matter. And mm -hmm. I mean, I, the thing is, is, it's a policy that they make should matter and there should be consequences for it. Right. And there's no there was no consequence for abortion policy. Well, now there is. I mean, now if, if you're if you're a state that has passed a total ban on abortion with no exceptions, as a lawmaker, you now have to sit and look in the eyes of the parents of a 10-year-old girl who can't get an abortion despite having been raped. Because by definition, no 10-year-old can be can lawfully engage in 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 in, in that sort of sense. So I, I mean yeah. you I mean yeah, you're you're if you voted for that policy, now you gotta look some people in the eye because it's really yeah. gonna take effect. Well, and I wouldn't take away, you know, that some individuals might vote, you know, might have also voted based on their their moral standing right sure or you know we, there's, we have, pro, there's uh, pro life exactly. there's a pro-life democrat running for the u.s congress in north dakota it, this cycle exactly exactly and so and i mean and I, I would say you know way many years ago uh i lived in south dakota and some of the work that i did with some college students uh in uh, lobbying against the juvenile death penalty um and that was a very narrow vote but the legislature passed it and uh, Senator Mike Rounds was governor at the time, and he and he was under a lot of pressure to not sign that bill um, to 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 you know going against the death penalty. But he was I, at the time I remember him as a as a practicing Catholic, you know, voting you know informed by his faith in that in that regard. And so I would never, uh, I, I mean, I, I have while I may disagree with some of the some of the uh, lawmakers that have voted in that way that has gone against their their party or or other pieces of the platform i do have that respect for how their um 
their their faith or, or other other aspects of morality or life experience might change their vote. And I would say that on you know on both sides. If there's a Republican who says I had this experience in my life or I you know I believe this thing and I'm going to go against my party for that, um, you know I have a lot of respect for that. Um, and, and so I would not rule that out in that process or in that. Um, that part of the sausage making that took place um, over the years. What's, what's what's really interesting is that if we look at if we look at the public polling on this issue, um, if if Roe hadn't been handed down, I think we would probably be at a place where in most states in the union, mm-hmm. abortion is legal, um, it, with with a restriction after a certain number of weeks, because that's where public opinion is. Most most Americans want abortion to be legal, but they also think that that the timing of the abortion matters. And they think it should be illegal, most of them, after some time period, usually 15 to 20. I mean, there's some variance there. I, I don't know. I, I think that's where our democracy, our democratic process in the various states would have settled. And to me, that looks like a very good compromise. You still have legal access, but it's a it's a moderated and regulated access. And that to me is 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 that's the middle position between it should always be illegal and it should always be legal. You know, those are the two extremes that have been guiding this debate. Most Americans are in the middle. That's where we would have been if Roe had never been decided. I feel like that's where we would have been as a country. And we, and we wouldn't even really be talking about this. I feel like it would have been settled by now. No, you know, I I uh, I respectfully disagree because I think uh, there are, are lots of other places where law has intervened and, uh, you know, or where where either be ruling or making of a law and the way that the debate happens continue publicly. I mean, I think about, and this is, I mean, I'm, I, yes, I'm making an apples to oranges argument, but when I think a little bit about like, for instance, the, the, the Voting Rights Act, right? And the Supreme Court, I mean, that has, um, clearly there are issues with voting across the country um, and the the Supreme Court saying, uh, you know, it, 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 we don't need it anymore, has has proven to to necessarily not be accurate in the way. I mean, ra- racism is still alive, uh, you know, right here in our own in our own state. We saw, uh, you know, and, and I'm making a because it's not a, a decided issue, but I mean that there there were those who walked away from the polls in Fargo during the primary and said, we feel because of our race, we were not treated the same as white voters. Um, and whether that led to voter suppression or not is a different question, a different conversation for a different day. But I think that, um, you know, I, I don't know if if Roe would never have happened um, if the conversation would have just, you know, gone progressive, yeah. uh, as we've seen the, the argument. So I because I think that there's other places, like I said, like with voting. And, well, and and I, don't, other, I don't I don't even know that you could say go you know. progressive. I mean, what is what yeah. is a what is a ban on abortion after 15 weeks? I mean, is that a pro-life position or a pro-choice position? I feel like Planned Parenthood might have a different answer to that question than I do. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't I don't know. Um, and, and you're I mean, that's, that's I, accurate, yeah. I, I guess I guess the voting issue. I mean, the problem with, with the voting issue is it's so um, it's so central to the how the politicians get their jobs. Right. I mean, it's that's that's like that's almost that issue belongs almost in its own galaxy of, of politics. Yeah. Um, Which is why I said it's apples to oranges. Right. You know, right. That's, that's but, but, I, but but the but the fact that, you know, that that um, the Supreme Court made a decision and we are still seeing that there are poten- there are potential issues. You yeah. know, I, I don't think it would have uh, sure. yeah, things wouldn't have just worked out because we had or didn't have it. You know, and, I mean, maybe, if we maybe... never had the Voting Rights Act, would there have been certain progress or protections that would have you know would would lawmakers have have quote unquote done the right thing and protected the right to vote in places where where racism right? Was, was I mean, in and, and, and I think you know, democracy is not a is not a panacea. Um, and in fact, democracy often becomes a tool by which, you know, people who are bigots or have untoward motivations, you know, they use it, right? They, they, they get, they try to get their voters out. They try to, you know, get their message across the same as everybody else. So, so democracy is always going to be rowdy. Um, it's just that I would rather have that. Um, because if, if you look on a, on a long enough timeline, we make progress, right? Uh-huh. I mean, being openly racist is not okay in 2022 america right. uh george wallace once ran for president and that was like a part of his platform so you know that's progress right and, and i understand for, if, if somebody who's experiencing it personally and viscerally that's cold comfort and i get that i'm not trying to say the problem has disappeared i'm trying to say we are getting better 
and we do get better and we have to trust the democratic process to express that as policy um i would rather do that than trust in courts and i realize that i'm saying this to the aclu which is the business of 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 getting yeah. the courts to 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 you know maybe do these things but i would well, rather actually, well actually rob i think that's something important to note is that you know when the aclu was was founded um you know the the the, the aclu is known for uh you know we'll see you in court like that's how people that's how right. people frame it it's it's the phone calls that I get all the time of people asking me, you know, legal questions. I work for the advocacy department. I'm not an attorney, but uh, it is interesting that that is that overwhelming perception. But the longer history of the ACLU from the founding really was uh, to be much more like a, a union. I mean, that's why that's in the name and to and to be able to influence policy. I mean, the, the largest um, the first budgets of the ACLU when it took on that that uh, that moniker, you know, that largest budget was uh, policy and influence. I think the uh, we've talked about it. Uh, the I think that the actual budget line item in those first ones was propaganda uh, was actually the the word that was used at the time. And so uh, the the even though that's what we're known for, um, there is a very wide swath of the work that we do that is about trying to poli do the policy development, right? It's not just about suing your way to victory. It's about how do we write better laws? How do we um, uh, influence public opinion? How do we, you know, I mean, obviously we're nonpartisan. We're not um, trying to work on candidate issues, but trying to work in the realm of exactly what we're talking about. And so on one hand, yes, I think you and I, and, and you know, we're fi we find some common ground on, yes, the policy part is really important, and, you know, but I think, um at the same time um we uh our interpretation uh as an organization of the Cong of of the constitution is uh is that's where you and i would differ yeah. we, you know well, I, per, I, just, I would say personally and professionally what, what that, i you know, that, yeah. that what, point, what, right? what i struggle with is is that the law should be intentional right like like if mm -hmm. it's if, if we're going to say that there's a right to something then at some point there should have been a, a democratic process that ended with an intentional and we intended to create that not not you know some black robed law professor founded in the penumbras I, I don't i don't buy that i don't like that i think that's i think that's abhorrent to a democratic society whatever the, the policy issue i don't want them to find rights to things that i like either um, I, I would rather I would rather fight for those in the legislative process, and, I, and that's why, like, I'm, I'm tired of people protesting outside of the Supreme Court, right? I, I think the court got this one right. Protest outside of Congress, protest outside of your legislatures, because to me, the message from the Supreme Court on Dobbs, on West Virginia versus EPA, and some others was, "Hey, legislators, legislate, right? If you want these things to be law, then write some laws." But stop, you know, and, and that, that frustrates me because so many, the courts have become, in my opinion, so overbearing. I, I think it's allowed legislatures to just sort of punt issues. We're going to write very vague laws and then we're going to wait for the courts to interpret their way to, to, to the right outcome. That's baloney. And, and that, to me, that's, that's got to stop. Well, and I think that I would say that, you know, there's a, there's a gray area between where we're at this point where I'd say, I think that there also has been because of Roe, right, there has been the opportunity for legislators to use the legislative process to challenge the legal process. Um, and so, uh, you know, we've seen all of our energy and our focus into let's write and design laws to get that court to get that court case to get to try and get that victory which is now what has happened right, the, the, course, right, the, right, the right was doing that i mean that that's what the dobbs yeah. case was was a mississippi law that was explicitly written to get the courts to overturn roe right and and, and so well I, yeah and and so i think that you know that that also has shaped the legislative process to be sure. about something that you know it wasn't helpful, but, but again, uh, you know, we're, we're coming from two different angles, which is, which is my opinion. Yeah, they, yeah. They, they were, they were, yeah. they were trying to get a, a mm -hmm. bad precedent in yeah. row in Casey, bad precedents yeah. overturned um, yeah. and, and restore it. I mean, I like just what justice Kavanaugh wrote in his concurrence, which was the constitution is neutral on abortion. If, now it doesn't have to be, you could amend the U S constitution to put in, oh an amendment regarding abortion if, if you wanted to, and you could build the appropriate level of democratic uh, support. 
Uh, or you could just create a federal statute because the Ninth Amendment allows for that sort of thing. Um, but anyway, that's uh, I, I, I think it's I think it's such an interesting such an interesting issue. I just said the Ninth Amendment. And you got all excited. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, though, I, I want to go back to because the, the whole the whole reason we were going to have this conversation was around the, the idea of like well, the worthiness of protesting. And I love what you, you said you know, <clears throat> protesting in front of the Supreme Court versus Congress, right? Uh, protest, uh, yes, protesting may not, uh, you know, protesting on the steps of the Supreme Court isn't going to get the cha- the Supreme Court to do something different. That's, you know, they're, they're, they're interpreting laws. They're not making them in that way. Uh, and at the same time, um, the, the power of protest to be able to uh, express how you're feeling, I, I mean, I don't think it matters which the steps of which place, you know, that you that you, uh, you would protest on, you're, you're raising, you're raising the issue. Um, and, and so for me, it's, it, the location of it isn't, uh, it isn't real important. It's about, you know, I mean, we, we protested here in Fargo, rallied and, you know, on the steps of the, uh, the Fargo City Hall, you know, which is, you know, they have, they have no, uh, you know, very, very little right. to do in this, yeah. you know, so I think uh, for me, it's, I think that uh, going, going back to sort of the, the idea of the, the value of protest, I, I would be curious for you, um, because like you, we started this by saying we probably agree on a, on a bunch of those things. Um, I, I was curious if you would expand a little bit about uh, what you had written in your column about you know, the, the, the value of, of protesting. Yeah. Well, I, cause I do think it's valuable and I do think it's a valuable expression of, of public sentiment. And, but to me, it, it has to be, it can't, it's not going to accomplish anything if it's indiscriminate. And then, and then also if it's, if it's alienating, um, hmm. which I think are two real problems. One, one is that we sometimes we, we're not protesting the right people, right? Your, your focus now that the Supreme court's ruled, your focus has got to be on the people who make the policy. So that's either ballot measures or in North Dakota, that's either ballot measures or the legislature mm-hmm. um, and and get involved there. That's that's the appropriate place. And then in terms of being alien and, and the right and the left do this, it's always my team versus your team. Political movements win through addition, not subtraction. And so I at some of these protests, I read some of the lines, some of the, the signs. And as a conservative who, by the way, is open to the idea of, of compromise on, on abortion. Right. I'm not a, I'm not a ban it all the time everywhere pro-life conservative but it's hard for me to make common cause with people who by reading their signs don't like people like me and don't seem interested in having us part of the coalition i mean that's i think that's another thing that we lose when when the courts grab these issues out of the democratic process is it robs us of that necessity for coalition building Mm -hmm. if you want to make policy you're not first of all you're going to have to accept the fact that you're not going to get everything you want because you got to compromise uh, and second of all, you're going to have to make common cause sometimes with people you don't like very much. And that's, you know, it's, it's got to be it's got to be inviting. Yeah, I, I, well, I, I agree that coalition building needs to be broader than that. I would say that uh, just even the response to Roe, there has been some ground level uh, coalition building in the sense that I think a lot of people. I personally spoke to folks at, um, you know, uh, on the day of the decision, there was a, an impromptu rally that took place that, you know, we were not a part of sponsoring, but I personally went as a citizen. Um, and then there was the 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 uh, the two events um, uh, that we had sponsored and we uh, are with partners and there was interest. It was very interesting for me to talk to folks uh, because we were getting, you know, while we might not have been uh, promoting a ballot measure, I mean, I think we're too early in the what's the response, you know, as it was coming down in real time. Um, and obviously, we're also far enough away from uh, when we could get it on something on a ballot or before the legislative session that's coming up. So uh, we're, you know, it's a little. It was a little too early, right, right away yeah. here as the decision came. But coalition building was happening, maybe only on sort of one side of the aisle, right? But there were definitely individuals that I knew, Republicans, Democrats, conservatives, that were all there um, finding camaraderie in a moment when they were upset. So, you know, I talked to some folks that were, you know, quote unquote, more conservative who had shown up and said, you know, this isn't something that I've ever done before, but I feel really strongly about this thing. I mean, I have family members. I grew up, I have some, you know, family members who are very conservative, but the one issue that was always their issue is don't tell me what to do with my body. And so, and those family members would never right. go to a protest like this, but they might now and find other common ground for the but, future movement. But I, but, right? I, but I also think that gets back to 
the, the policy that we have on the books is going to be enforced now. And mm-hmm. and I think a lot of the total bans are are probably go a lot further than where the average, even somebody who thinks of themselves as being conservative Republican goes a lot further than where they're willing to go. And, and also, if, if they're going to be enforced, have some practical implications that maybe we hadn't considered back when we passed them because we never thought that they would be enforced. I mean, there's real opportunity to build there. And in a place like North Dakota, you're just not going to win anything politically without getting some Republicans on board. You're just, yeah. it's the way our and state's think, constituted. And I think the rally in front of City Hall was was step one. I think it brought together folks that were a variety of, of stripes because there were, I know, you know, there were signs that even, you know, may, might have made me personally uncomfortable for you, know, even though we're, we agree. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to, you could show up to any yeah, protest oh, yeah, no, for anything yeah. and find some nuts. Right. I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, that is what I, but, it is. but I think, uh, I think step one of the coalition building step one of policy change took place on a, on a hot day in July where about a thousand people showed up, um, you know, and, and I noticed a lot of, of, of age diversity there. There was racial diversity there. Uh, I think there was some political diversity there as I talked to a few folks and they all came together um, to, to, to talk to, to, to the, the new friendships were made, new relationships were made for the larger movement in the future. So I think, I don't think it's exclusive. I think Rob, what you're saying about the policy part, you know, I think that's step two. Step one was um, those those folks rallying around it, um, getting getting out their feelings, uh, connecting with other people uh, that they may not have known before. Uh, it also gave an opportunity for those who disagree. You know, there were counter protesters that were there, um, and, and 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 a number of folks that were there holding prayer vigil uh, on the edge of of the time. And for the most part, that was a very respectful. There was a couple folks I think that were. That we're maybe having some verbal yeah, like altercation, like, like but I for said, the most like part, said, it was very peaceful. Yeah, no, you know? no, no sides got no sides got a monopoly on nuts. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so it was, but I think it, like I said, I think it was step one, and I think that uh, that uh, that this what happened uh, there, the impromptu rally, and the two other rallies that happened here in Fargo. I can't speak to the other communities because I wasn't present where where that happened, but I think. What happened is citizens of the of the Fargo Moorhead area came together um, and and started to lay the groundwork of whatever is future because you know signatures were collected. People who wanted to give their name to us or to Planned Parenthood or other organizations, they did that. And those are folks that we can follow up with to say, what do we want to do? That's well, next? And, and, I, can, and that's you know, that's honestly what I'm excited about. I, I feel like yeah. on a long enough timeline, North Dakota is probably going to have a more moderate policy on abortion than <laughs> that trigger law. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's going to take some time to get there. I think it's going to take some time. We've we've been in trench warfare on this issue for a long time, and I think it's going to take a while for some people to climb up out of those trenches and 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 try to find a new path. And and honestly, I'm excited about that. And I think that is a great gift. I and and again, you probably hear this as heresy, but I think it's a great gift that the Supreme Court gave us. And and also, whether you like it or not, they gave it to us. So here we are. And I would I would rather have this. I would rather have a meaningful debate to develop policy that will actually be applied than to have, you know, again, law professors in robes settling the issue for us. That's all the time I have for you though, Cody. I really appreciate it. You coming on. Yeah, I do. I just want to say, I, I agree that uh, I, I, you and I disagree on that foundational point. uh, But I think I'm also, which is, which is moot now, which is moot. Yeah. I'm, I'm a still I'm a similar learning guy, and so I also agree that there is a I look for the positives in this, and so I think there is great opportunity here, and so on that we do agree. Thank you for your time, Cody. Hey, thanks. Good, to ha- glad to be here. Hi, everybody. I'm Chad Cool, host of the Northland Outdoors podcast. Hey, here in the Northland, we love our time outside, and on the Northland Outdoors podcast, we're going to talk about all of it, not just fishing, not just hunting. But mountain biking, camping, rock climbing, bird watching, you name it. We're going to have it on the Northland Outdoors podcast. New episodes every two weeks on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. So look for it and join us on the Northland Outdoors podcast. Well, just finish up an interview with Cody Schuler with the uh, North Dakota ACLU. Well, they're not just the North Dakota. I think they're a regional thing. I think it's North Dakota, Minnesota, South Dakota. Anyway, uh, he's always fun to talk to. Um, we disagree on a lot, but we agree. And I, again, I think I think we're moving towards a a brighter future where we're going to be settling important questions, even seemingly intractable political questions like abortion, settling them through the the democratic process 
rather than in a courtroom because as hard as it is we have to settle we have to settle policy questions there not in court but let's switch gears let's talk to somebody who works in court a great deal kim hebvik she uh, is currently an assistant state's attorney with the cass county state's attorney's office uh she is campaigning to be the state's attorney for the cass county uh the, the cass county state's attorney um so we're going to be uh, going to be talking to her right now. And Kim, first of all, tell us about your campaign. What what prompted you to want to run for uh, for state's attorney? Well, I have been in the office for it'll be 16 years this fall. My boss, Birch Burdick, he is retiring after 24 years. I and is, and is, is, years. is something of a political. Uh, I mean, his his last name, Quentin Burdick. I mean, he's a. Uh, a legend i don't is that is that too far i mean he's he's had a lot of notoriety oh yeah his family um it's it would be nearly impossible to run against him the federal courthouse is named after his father his father also i think job corps is named after him maybe even a building on ndsu now there's a big old street there's a big old street through the center of minot named after him yeah and i and i love the fact that his mom served in the united states the first, legislature. first first female uh first female senator from north dakota i think that's fantastic well so what what prompted you to want obviously he's he made the decision to step down so you're not running against him uh ryan youngren who is your colleague in the office uh you're running against him um so again i guess that that was my question to you what uh what mm-hmm. made you want to run well, I have a vision for the office, and I would love an opportunity to make that vision a reality. I kind of came up in prosecuting through working in juvenile court and working in um, drug courts. So I have a philosophy that I've developed throughout the years, and certainly I've been able to indoctrinate portions of the office already, but I would love the opportunity to take that further. There is a perception in um, in Fargo specifically, because again, you'd be the Cass County State's Attorney if, if you won this election. There's a perception that that crime is becoming more of a problem than it has been perhaps in years past. Can you speak to that? Sure. One of the things that I have done routinely in our office, just because I think it's very interesting, is to run our numbers as far as the the number of things that are being sent to our office to review. Um, things that ultimately get charged out, what our numbers look like. And um, not surprisingly, from 2019 to 2020, numbers jumped. I don't think that's a surprise to anybody with what happened with COVID and the criminal justice system screeching to a halt, crime rates rising, mental health issues, substance use disorders. It's that it was down in 2021 in 2021 compared to 2020 for our office. And my prediction is that the crime rate in Cass County will actually dip again this year from last year. But I can certainly see why it's feeling like crime is rising. Um, drug crimes, I think, in particular, are probably up which would not be surprising. I think that follows a national trend for drug crimes rising. Um, But overall, I think that we will see a slight decline from last year. The numbers in our office went from about 8,700. My prediction is we'll be, you know, um, it was closer to 8,900. I'm thinking we're gonna see about 8,600 roughly. Those are those are like criminal files, criminal cases. Um, this is just the whole numbers for what comes into our office. So it's everything from okay. the people who are referred to drug court, okay. our appeals, our, our criminal cases, our personal crimes cases, because we handle a lot. Our office handles not only the criminal side of things, but we also handle some civil things as well. Juvenile delinquency cases, uh, mental health cases. What do you think people would be surprised? I mean, I, I think obviously most people listening to this know what they know what a prosecutor does. They know what the Cass County State's Attorney's Office does. What's a part of that job that do you think the average public would be surprised to learn about or or, or maybe a maybe a common misconception about the job? Well, we're not the attorney general's office. Um, I'm not quite sure why they chose to name us the state's attorneys because we're essentially the county attorney or the district attorney. 
um, were not the U.S. attorney. So my office is not at the federal courthouse. I think also people would be maybe surprised at the number of people who commit offenses that we never see again. For example, um, DUI offenders, about 80% don't reoffend after their first time. I think people might also be surprised to learn that my office is not an investigating agency. We don't employ any investigators, any law enforcement agencies. We are separate and apart from them. We work closely with them, obviously, but everything that we review comes over to us from the vast majority come from Fargo Police Department, West Fargo Police Department, North Dakota Highway Patrol, and DSU, and then of course the Cass County Sheriff's Office. Do you your your um the incumbent is um Birch Burdick has been in office, like you mentioned, for for about two and a half decades. Um what would you do? I mean, that, that's a long time for someone to be in office and, and without being critical at all of him. Um, and what would you do differently? I mean, I mean, do you think there's things that need to be changed about how the office goes about its business? Overall, I think Birch has run a very good office. I, I think that he has done his administrative duties, of course, but also given the prosecutor, prosecutors in our office the discretion that they need in order to do their jobs as well. I I would like to see more of a trend toward looking at the research of what actually works for curbing the recidivism rates, um, the rates that people commit new crimes. Uh, I think there's a lot of data, a lot of research out there that we just haven't dug into to be able to apply it to our, our caseloads. Give me, give me an example. Well, for example... Um, so many, somewhere along the line, we decided that to hold people accountable and to punish them, the immediate answer was incarceration. And there's actually a whole gamut of things that we can do to hold people accountable and keep them in the community. So for example, those DUI offenders, 80% of them probably don't, don't need to be incarcerated. A large percentage of them, if we were to do a chemical dependency evaluation, won't require any services. And in fact, if we were to put them into, um, say, inpatient treatment, for example, we could actually make them worse. And when we are incarcerating people, I think the magic number is like 48 hours, and then their risk of reoffending actually goes up. And when we're when we're looking at reducing crime, I think that there are a lot of community-based services that if they're delivered effectively, we could see instead of that immediately feeling good about sending somebody um, to either the jail or the prison, we could see better returns with our, our dollars that we're spending if we could plug people into the right services, hold them accountable, certainly, but also be looking long-term. Uh, your your opponent is is Ryan Youngren, who's also working in your office. I've, I've always wondered, like when uh, when a deputy, two deputies run against each other for sheriff or or two states attorney, how does that work? You're working in the same office with the person that you're also running against for this office. We all know that political campaigns can get personal and ugly. Not to say that this one has, but but they can be. I mean, it can be uncomfortable. Talk about that dynamic a little bit. Oh, it's absolutely uncomfortable. I would be lying if I said that it wasn't. Ryan's office is two doors down from mine. We've worked together since he joined our office 15 years ago. Uh, we certainly have a few things that we don't see eye to eye on. Um, but overall, I think both of us have intended to run a clean race, not get down and dirty. We both, I think, want people to vote for us because they think that we're the best candidate, not because they dislike the other person. Talk about some of the differences between you. You said you disagree on some things or, or talk about that, because that's to me, that's that's the nuts and bolts of a campaign. Right. Voters have a choice yeah. to make this person or that person. What are the contrasts in your mind? I. I think that trying jury trials, for example, that is a part of what we do, but that is a very, very small percentage of what we do. 
There are 16 prosecutors in our office who come to work every day, passionate about their jobs and fully equipped to try a case against someone. There is so much more to our work. Obviously, we have over 8,000 cases a year, and if every one of those went to trial, that would back up our system significantly. I had mentioned before that my kind of background coming into this has to do with um, the, the drug court program, for example, juvenile court. So I've really embraced as I've gone on in my career, this idea that if you can get to the underlying causes, the root causes for people's behavior, you can affect change not only in the immediate, but down the road. So in juvenile court, for example, we look at holding people, holding, holding people accountable, but also utilizing least restrictive means. Juvenile court does a really good job at running the the kids through risk assessments, risk needs assessments. So you can determine not only what's driving their behavior, but what programming you might be able to utilize to change that behavior. I think that a lot of that can carry over to drug court and, and drug court also really focuses on research and what changes people's behavior, not just what feels good in the immediate, but what can actually change their behavior down the road. When you're looking at incarcerating somebody, in the, the county jail, I think it's $110 a day or something like that, over $40,000 a year. The penitentiary, over $50,000 a year to house somebody. Drug courts, the average is every dollar that a community spends on drug court programming is about a $27 savings. And I, I, oh, I, think, well, I, I, I think all that's very interesting. I, I think North Dakota is... Um, like a lot of places, I think we've been making we've been making ground on on criminal justice reform. That's that's a that's a term with a lot of different meanings. It's a big umbrella, a lot of a lot of policies underneath it. I sense that there's some backlash against it, right? Because that that progress has been happening for a long time. It's been happening in our prisons where we've made reforms about how we do that. It's been happening in the courts where we've made reforms. Um, it's even been happening in the news media, right? We've been having a debate about how we use mugshots, for instance. Um, which I've I've written a lot about, which I think is a very interesting debate. I'm I'm beginning to sense some backlash, and we we see it really in other parts of the country, but like in San Francisco, where you know people who came in who who were perceived as being very pro criminal justice reform, um, but then those communities had rampant problems with crime and homelessness, and people wanted kind of a kind of a backtrack to law and order. So obviously North Dakota is not San Francisco. We're not Seattle. We're not New York City. You know, where Cass County certainly isn't those things. It's it's Fargo and and the other communities, um, but I, I I do perceive that there could be a backlash against some of that, um, particularly after what we just went through with the pandemic. There's a perception that crimes get out of control. We're having lots of protests. Like I I think a lot of Americans, rightly or wrongly, are perceiving things as kind of spiraling a bit, and that may I think engender some some pushback on the sort of things you're talking about speak to that a little bit. Like, how do you continue to make the case for criminal justice reform in this environment? What I think is really interesting is if you look at the national trends, the the red states, the red cities are experiencing the same crime rates, the same um, safety concerns that the communities that have enacted more of the criminal justice reform have. And in fact, I think that there are some areas where they have enacted less criminal justice reform and they've seen an increase in crime. I think we need to be very careful about wanting to feel safer versus actually being safer, if that makes sense. So if you have, for example, we had what, three shootings in a weekend? That doesn't translate to three times as many shootings. Yeah. And I, I think that that goes back to my interest in actually looking at the research, actually looking at the numbers rather than just going off of well, pu public field. perception. I can remember years ago, um, the local media, I live, I live up here in Minot and the local media 
was was kind of running about this this crime wave that had hit Minot over the years, and it was like carjackings are up, and I'm like carjackings in Minot, like what is going on? Well, it turned out there was a there was, and I'm not I'm not saying it's okay or it was a good thing. But there was a bunch of teenagers who were breaking into cars and taking them for joy rides. Not great. It kind of sucked. But but because they did it like five or six times, there was like a 400% increase in carjackings in Minot, right? Because it almost never happened before. And then we had a spate of one small group of people doing them and we saw an increase and then it created this perception, oh, things are going to hell in Minot. Well, not really. <laughs> so I, I, I do think that context is really important. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about, um, a situation that came up in the casket. I was, I was part of reporting it. My colleague, April Baumgarten at the forum, obviously, uh, did a lot of excellent work on this. Um, and it was, it was related to a relationship between someone in your office, a prosecutor, Sherilyn Turnus, and a detective for the Fargo police department. Now you said earlier, obviously your office doesn't employ investigators, um, you work closely with the police department, but you're independent. And I always think that's such an important part of the criminal justice system that a lot of people don't necessarily understand that the police are not partners with the prosecutors. The police are independent. They're there to establish the facts of a case that are going to be used by both the defense and the prosecution. Um, so in, in that situation, though, it was a relationship between a prosecutor and a detective. And I want to be, first of all, I have absolutely no problem with that. They're human beings. People fall in love. That's great. I think the problem was it wasn't it wasn't disclosed. And, and certainly that's been the complaint for defense attorneys where they were saying, listen, this wasn't disclosed to us in a timely fashion. Um, what are your feelings about the way your office handled that? I think that's where communication is so important because I think people were assuming that everybody knew but not everybody knew. And I think that both Sherilyn and Troy are extremely ethical. I think they're both very good at what they do. But when um, not everybody knows about the relationship, then there might be a perception that there's a conflict of interest. I don't think that either one of them would compromise a case because of their relationship. And, 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 and to be clear, there's in, in everything that I've looked at, there's been no evidence that that's happened. It's it's just exactly. the only the only sticking point has been the fact of the relationship. So, so I don't want to besmirch either of them. I have no reason to disbelieve you, you're you're telling me that they're completely ethical, honest people. I have no reason to dispute that at all. So I, I don't I know I don't want to make it like I'm trying to besmirch them. Your argument is it's, it's communication. One issue, because when I, I, I communicated with, with Birch Burdick about this, you know, he had told me that, that they had put in place policies to make sure, but yet we still had cases going on months later after he had been made aware of the relationship where, you know, there were defense attorneys saying, listen, the lead investigator in my murder case is is dating the prosecutor. Um you know, they were feeling like like they like there should have been a disclosure. She should have been reassigned. I mean, obviously, that's problematic, isn't it? I think that the prosecutors handling that case had done what they could to to limit that appearance. And I think that the legal research would show that um, from a legal standpoint, our office had done nothing wrong in not disclosing that information sooner, but also what um, April quoted in her story this morning, as far as the ethical obligations of the prosecutor, they might differ from what legally is defensible. I think I, I like that the two of them are dating. I, I think that sure. they're both really nice people. And yeah. I, um, but I can also see the other side where as a defense attorney, you're wanting to do the best that you can for your client. And if you're not aware that this information is out there and it, it comes to light at the last minute, then you don't know exactly how you're going to ap approach it or address it in front of a jury. If you had been the state's attorney and had learned about this relationship, how would you have handled it? 
That is a great question. And um, when this came to light, my thought has always been, we should be as transparent as possible. And again, to me, I think it just goes back to communication. When I found out about it, I thought that I was the last to find out about it. Or I assumed that everybody else in the office knew. And I think that's probably part of the problem is that everybody assumed that everyone else knew, but people didn't know. Um, so as you said before, Birch has been working on policies. A lot of us have been contributing input to that, but I, I think we can always be doing better, right? And we can learn from every instance how we how we can do better. Your office, because it kind of you, it, it's it's kind of interesting. I, I I've always thought that the because, like you said, you are independent from the investigators, the law enforcement agencies, the sheriff's department, the police departments. Um, they're separate, and they do the investigations, and then they bring a case to you. And then you decide, are we going to prosecute it? Are we not going to prosecute it? What charges are we going to bring? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then the laws that you're enforcing are also made by another independent. Well, it really, too, the legislature. And then obviously the, the governor's office has the veto authority. Um, what is the role of the state's attorney in terms of of policymaking? Right. Because obviously that's the realm that I work in. Right. All day long. It's it's you know, that's what this whole political thing is about is in pursuit of what policies we want in place. So what is the role of your office in saying, you know, for instance, like criminal justice reform or drug courts or whatever? Do you see it as your job to, to stand up and tell the legislature, listen, we need this and not this? Yeah, to a certain extent, I, I think that we do have that role. And I think part of it is because of the unique position that we're in. We are constantly having to balance the reports that we get from law enforcement with the victims and um, meeting their needs. Also, um, the legislature, the law, if statutes aren't working, I think we have an obligation to figure out why they're not working and see if we can help fix them. Also, when our cases get appealed, then um, we have to look at what those opinions from the Supreme Court mean. And if we had a role in creating the either the statute or the case law, going back, reviewing that and seeing how we can make things better, because ultimately everybody has the same goal. We, we want a safe community. We want people to feel safe and secure in their homes. We want people to stay here and raise their families. Um, but also we have to think about resources. And as prosecutors, we have wide discretion on what we charge, what we recommend for sentences, um, how we move our cases through the system, how we might resolve them. And I think we have to be very mindful of that because I do think that we are in a very powerful position. But because of that position, I think we're also um, able to create a lot of change. I, I think it's, I, I like about the powerful position. I mean, it's, you wield probably the most awesome power government has, right? The ability to deny people their liberty. Um, I mean, obviously you can't just unilaterally, it's through the court and a jury or a judge weighs in or whatever. But I mean, really, that's what your office is doing. You are, you are working often to deny people liberty, um, for, for excellent reasons. I put it that way. It sounds terrible. Uh, but obviously, I mean, these are people we're, we're doing it in response to somebody who is uh, allegedly committed a crime. So I guess what I'm trying to say is hugely important. Awesome, awesome power. Um, it's where the rubber meets the road, really. Where, so let me, let me ask you this last question. Why you and not Mr. Youngren? Why, why should, why should Cass County's voters say we want you to be the new prosecutor and not Mr. Youngren? Well, first I want to go back to, um, yes, we do have awesome power, but the court, the the judges really sure. are making those ultimate decisions. Check, check, and I checks think, and balances, right. But I also think that we can't hide behind their decisions either. And if they're not giving us the bail, exa uh, for example, if they're not giving us the, the bail 
requests that we're making, where are we being deficient in our arguments for that? Because we want to be making sure that those people who are not safe in our community are being held. We want to make sure that those are the people that we're concentrating our resources on. Um, if we're not getting the sentences that we want, again, we have so much data that we haven't tapped into that if we did, I, th I think that we could make better, stronger arguments to the judges and I think we could get better sentences. But on the flip side, I think we also have an obligation to treat each case um, uniquely because all the situations are different. Every every case, the facts are different. And I think um, my view of what the role is, I would like us to be more effective inside the courtroom, but also outside the courtroom. I think that's one of the areas why I think people should vote for me is because my vision for the office is not centered around the courtroom. It's so much broader than that. It's how can we utilize our position to strengthen our partnerships, not only with law enforcement, but also with public health and the um, parole and probation and um, homeless services, even the DOT, to help people to not even get into the system, or if they do, to get them out as quickly as possible. And then on the end, supporting things that help with a successful re-entry into the community. I think that's why Adam and F5, they're doing such good work. Adam Martin. Helping yeah, people. The F5 yeah, project. Adam Martin. Yeah. The, um, I, I, I agree with you. I, I used, I, I would get really, um, frustrated, uh, like DUI policy is one example. And, and it was like, we were measuring the success of DUI policy by the number of people we were arresting for DUI. And, and I, and I get it. Enforcement's part of the, part of the equation. We want to catch people who are, who are breaking the law. But, but I always thought like, what if we just want to get people home safe? Right. I mean, what if the, the, the point is public safety? The point is not incarceration. And I, I think sometimes we just take it for a given. Well, there's criminals out there. And the only thing we do with criminals, is we throw them in jail. And I mean, in, in the most basic way, yes, that's that's correct. But I mean, it, it seems to me like if we get to a point where we're putting in people in jail, then there's probably some failures along the way that um, that we could talk about. I mean, listen, some people are just going to have to go to jail. They're, they make terrible decisions. They do terrible things. And they're just going to have to go to jail. That's reality. That's society. Um, but I, I think there's so much more that we could do sometimes. And, and just the way we talk about the issue, the way we measure the problems, um, our priorities, you know, the right, the, the data that we're prioritizing, that matters so much more. And so I, I guess when I hear someone say that my vision, it, it's odd to hear a state's attorney say that their vision for the office is not centered around the courtroom. It's like, well, what else do you do? You're in the courtroom all day. Um, but I think that's refreshing, like, because if we're in a courtroom, something's broken down. And, and maybe the something that's broken is not something we can do about, but often it is something we can do about, and we ought to be talking about it. Yeah, I completely agree. When when we see people back time and time again, we should be asking ourselves, what did we do wrong as well? Yes, they're making, they're making poor decisions, but if we're not trying to at least figure out how to dig down to the root of what's causing their behavior, how can we expect to change it? That's when we're sending people to the penitentiary, for example, if all they're doing is, is sitting in a cell, why do we expect that when they come out, they're going to all of a sudden become law abiding? Yeah. Well, that's again, to, to your point about the, the DUI offender, like the 40, I, I had never thought about, it. I guess I was aware of the phenomena, but like 48 hours, like if you keep somebody incarcerated for more than 48 hours you may do some things to them I mean, you may alter the trajectory of their lives because you get past 48 hours well that's when they're going to have to start explaining why they're not at work uh, that's where things are going to open their family family may turn their backs on them work may fire them you know someone who okay i got a dui now i've also lost my job because I got a DUI. I mean, you've put them on a trajectory to more possibly more substance abuse possible more crime commission what have we done in terms of, of, of our goal of creating a safe society? What have we done? You know, we've, we've hurt ourselves, not helped ourselves. And that's the sort of thing we got to get away from. So anyway, Kim Hegvik, 
candidate for Cass County State's Attorney. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Did you know Forum Communications Company has a robust podcast library? At inforum.com forward slash podcasts, we have everything from politics, sports, true crime, outdoor adventure, and more. Visit inforum.com forward slash podcasts and explore them all today.